Hey, have you ever woken up and said, I want to build the coolest mountains in Minecraft? No? Well, it doesn't matter because after this video, you will. And with the Axiom mod, you can create stuff like that and so much more in no time. So today I'm here to show you how. Welcome to the second part of this tutorial series where we will be learning how to terraform with Axiom. Step by step, we are going to go through different functionalities like the rock tool, melting, and the angle mask, for example, among all the others you can see here on the board. There's a lot to cover, so let's jump into it. We've seen the basics of camera movement and settings at the beginning of part 1 of this tutorial series, so if you need to learn about those, the link is in the description below. On the bottom right corner of the screen, you will see my key presses, so look over there if you have any doubts about what I'm doing at any moment of the video. All of the tools we'll be covering today are from the editor mode, and to access that we need to press right shift. And now we see all this set of tools to the left, and all this set of options to the right. Most of the times when we want to create something from scratch, especially if we start in a flat or void world, we need some basic shapes as the base for our build. Some quick options here that I like to use are first, the freehand tool. With it you can choose the type of brush and the size, and when we right click and drag it, it will create terrain as we go. We can also change the type of lock if we want to, for example sand, oak and spruce, and remember we can always undo our actions with Ctrl+C and redo them with Ctrl Y. The freehand is a very simple tool, so let's take a moment here to check a few useful things we can do with the settings. The values of the slide goes from 0, which means we'd be painting with only one block, all the way up to 50. But if we hover over, we can see that it says Ctrl click to set a value. If we do that, we can now type in whatever number that we want. And this is very important because it works for any of the sliders of every tool that you'll find within Axiom. So let's put 100 for example, and now our sphere is going to be way bigger. Of course, the bigger it is, the longer it will take to process, so be careful with those numbers. Another way to change the size of the brush as we go is by pressing Ctrl and the mouse wheel, and then drag it in or out. As you can see, the size will automatically be reduced or increased, which is very helpful and can speed up the workflow by a lot. Moving on to the shapes of the brush, we have the basic ones, which are sphere, cube and octahedron, but now, with version 2, we have a lot more of options. Most of them, like the cylinder, have two parameters, radius and height, but they work the same way. These new shapes allows us to create many different things that will fit our needs when creating the build that we want. But I will let you check them individually. The freehand tool is very simple, fast and straightforward, but not the best when it comes to finer details. So when we have a more specific idea in mind, I recommend using the create option from up here. This allows us to choose a sphere, cuboid, cylinder, cone or pyramid. When we click it, it will open a tab where we can change the size in the three dimensions as well as other parameters. For example, let's choose cuboid. The first time we hit place, we will see a preview of the cube. We can then click anywhere to place that preview and now a few arrows will appear around the shape. This will let us move it around. And once it's in the position that we want, we go and hit place again or enter on the keyboard and the shape will appear in the world. Another thing we can do with the preview is grab the handles and drag them around to rotate the shape in any angle that we want around the different X, Y and Z axes. We can also make it bigger or smaller with the width parameter in this case and again input any number to make it even larger. Let's now suppose that we want a very specific angle or perhaps go back to a flat cube. Well, under here in advance, we can see all the rotation parameters and once again, control click and type in any number, for example, 000 to get a flat cube again. Two more things, we can make it hollow by checking this box or separate the X, Y, Z axis, which will let us have more interesting shapes like a rectangle, for example. Using the create shape, we can get a more specific basic layout for our terrain. This takes a lot more time than just using the freehand tool but in this way you can get a more solid starting point or planning stage. Now that we have that for our terrain, how do we make it look more natural? Well, we can start with one of the favorites, the rock tool. To the right, we must select our active block, which is the block that we will be using to create the rocks. To the left, we will find different parameters. The first ones are the exact same as for the free hand tool, like brush shape and size. But there are a bunch of new ones, like noise radius, smoothness and so on. Increasing the noise radius will make it so that the noise varies slowly in space. In other words, the smaller the radius, the more noise it will be. The noisiness determines how strong the noise has to be applied. 
the smoothness as it says in the tooltip, depending on how high it is, it will smooth the rocks with its roundings further apart. And at last, the melding tells us how much the rocks will accommodate the previous terrain. The stronger the melding, the more it will blend with the shapes of the terrain it has below. In this case, we will use the rock tool to try and give some of our basic rectangles a more interesting and natural look. For that, I chose a size of brush relative to the size of our rectangles and carefully tried to work around them. This could also work in replacement of the freehand tool, when creating the base terrain in case we want to start with something a bit more random. Another tool we can use to build cliffs and ledges around our rectangles is the Sculpt Draw tool. With this one we can check the shape of the build, and it is based on the direction that the surface is facing, which basically means it will pull the blocks outside in that direction. One of the parameters of interest is invert, with this one on instead of pulling, the tool will remove or push the blocks inside the surface. Mask Y is another one which will basically make it so it will only add blocks in the Y or vertical direction. This tool is specifically useful to carve out shapes out of our basic rectangles and add ledges where it's needed, so it's definitely worth it to give it a try. Removing terrain with inverted sculpt draw is fine, but sometimes it can be a bit too rough. So if we want to carve out or remove areas of the terrain we don't like in a more controlled manner, we can use the great and amazing Melt tool. This tool, as the name suggests, allows us to melt the blocks. It's not the same as painting with air. With this, we can smoothly remove some parts without altering too much the surroundings. Of course, this will depend on the parameters like the shape of the brush, the smoothing strength and the smoothing threshold. However, as there were parts that we had to remove, we might want to still add some terrain. For example, let's say we don't want this sharp edge between these two surfaces. For that, we can use the Weld tool, which works in the opposite way as the Melting tool. It will use the active block to fill in the gaps in a smooth way. The parameters are exactly the same as for the Melt. Combining melting and welding around our rectangles can help us to quickly modify the terrain. With a bit of patience though, we can create stuff like ledges, naturally art bridges, caves and probably a lot more, so check both of these for sure. But still, as you can probably notice behind me, the shapes are a bit rough, but nothing to worry because that has a very easy fix with the smoothing tool. This one is in my opinion one of the most important tools within the mod. With the smooth tool we can very easily soften the shapes we created to achieve a more polished look. However, there are different settings that we can change, which provides us with different functionalities for different scenarios that we might encounter. As always, we have shape, size and strength, but down below, under modifiers, we can see three buttons here that say Melt, Stable and Grow. By default, it is set to Stable. This will make it so that the tool maintains the same number of blocks that we originally had during the smoothing. This often helps to preserve the original shape that we had while making it look less noisy. If we hit melt while smoothing, the tool will be able to remove blocks. This is the one that I like the most, basically because I tend to start with big structures so then I can carve them out without worrying too much. If we hit grow instead, it works the opposite way, meaning that the tool can now add new blocks. In general, Grow is good to use when we see a small hole that we need filling during the smoothing. On top of these three settings, we can also change the block ratio, which works in a similar way. So, if we are in stable but we increase the block ratio, the smoothing, as you can see, will now add blocks. And going below 100, it will remove the blocks. With this parameter, we can have a bit more control on the amount of blocks to add or remove from our terrain. At last we have fixed edges, which is set to on by default and I would recommend keeping it that way because it basically merges the smoothed area with the existing terrain. Something important to consider though is that the tool will not only affect the blocks inside the radius of the brush, but it will also consider and modify surrounding blocks as we drag the brush along. With this tool now and the different parameters, I shall spend some time polishing the shapes that we already had. Opposed to the smooth tool, we have Roughen, which works kinda the opposite way, right? It will modify the terrain to make it less smooth. This is great to add variation when we have a surface that is very smoothed out to the point where it can look unnatural. So it's a matter of balance with these two tools and it's up to your objectives and preferences. So now let's head into my favorite tool, the one that got me into action, the slope tool. This is an incredible tool that, as the name suggests, is for creating slopes between two points. How it works is quite simple, we just click on one block at a given Y level 
and then move the mouse until we reach a second block. We will see a green line appearing with a number that indicates the angle of the slope between those two blocks. We can see how depending on our second block that angle will change. Now when we hit and hold the right click we will see a grid appearing. This is sort of a map for the terrain that we will be creating and if we now drag the mouse along we will see the terrain appearing in the direction of that slope. Bear in mind that the block used is going to be of the same kind as the blocks right below. We can change the radius of the brush and the Y limit. This last one is useful when we are in scenarios like this for example where we don't want the slope to pull blocks of grass from below. With this parameter we are basically limiting the height of the slope brush. In version 2.0 we have a few new settings that made this tool even better. Right here we can choose Rise, which will limit the tool to only create terrain along the direction of the slope. We can also choose Lower, which is not going to create terrain but instead is going to destroy it, and that is marked with red. And both will remove when there's terrain in the way of the slope and add when there's air to fill. We can also change the smoothness of the slope and the shape. So instead of having a plane, we can have a cone, and it's very easy to visualize this in the grid that is shown when using the tool. And at last, we have the follows. This basically determines the strength to apply when creating the brush. So for example, the first one will create a uniform slope where all the blocks have the same height. With the other ones, the strength will decay as we move apart from the center. I recommend that you try by yourself and play around with the different follows to see what different results you can get. Sometimes the slopes are too symmetrical or smooth in a way that can look unnatural. So something really quick that we can do is to apply the roughen tool that we have seen before only a few times to the slope and then smooth it up until we get something that preserves the slope shape or the slope angle but that is maybe not so perfect and looks more realistic. An alternative to the roughen tool to break the smoothness a bit is distort, which allows us to configure different scales and parameters to apply a simplex noise to the terrain. A way to think about this tool is that it will add some small mounds or bumps to the terrain, that maybe we can later smooth out a bit. Now it's time for the last and probably the most versatile tool for terrain creation, and that's the elevation tool. To use it, just hold right click over some blocks and it will rise the terrain with the default settings. In some ways, the parameters we can modify here work similarly to the slope tool. You can see we have a Y limit. If we click here, it will affect both the rectangle and the grass. If we don't want that, we just reduce this value and it will only affect the rectangle, unless we drag the center of the brush over the grass, of course. Here we can rise, which is the one we've seen. We can lower, which is pretty straightforward. We can flatten, which let's say we raised a bit of terrain first and now we want to flatten at a given level. We just use this setting and drag around to push all the terrain around it to that height where we first clicked. We can also flatten up, which is only going to raise the terrain to reach that height of the first block pressed, but it's not going to bring down the blocks that are above. And flatten down works the exact opposite way. It's going to bring down blocks to reach the level, but it's not going to raise them. Increasing the rate is going to make the tool work stronger, for instance zero it's not going to do anything, and the more we increase it, the faster it will work. And at last, just like the slope tool, we have the different falloffs, which are exactly the same, stronger at the peak of each curve. But now, the feature that makes this tool, as I said before, the most versatile for terrain creation is this button right here. This allows us to import height maps. You can find some free height maps over the internet. I will put the link on the description from the ones that I'm using. This is a pack from Evman. To load them in, you just need to drop them into the folder that pops up when you hit the load height map button. A way to think of the height maps is similar to the falloffs. For instance, where you see white is like the peak of the curves, which means that the terrain will be higher there. And as it gets darker, the amount of terrain created will be less. Like here, where we can see the three white peaks very clearly. If we rotate or change our player position, the height map will rotate with us, so use that information wisely to create interesting terrain. Using different height maps and even different follow-ups and parameters, you can very quickly create stuff like this. We can even add more details with a smaller brush size. It's a very powerful tool and I absolutely recommend that you try it out by yourselves. So now that we've covered most of the tools for terrain creation, let's spend some time actually using them to create something that looks better than this. So let's go. So I started to change the shape of the bigger hill at the back with the melt tool. 
until I got some sort of rounded eroded part that separated it into two different peaks that later on I kept polishing individually. I also did a similar work with the shape of the big rock to the right. As you can see, I didn't hold back with the melting. Then I followed with the smooth tool to polish some of the weird edges where I felt it needed to be smoothed out. When I was happy with that, I started to work on the side of the rectangles that I had left untouched before. Here I simply used the well tool with the cube brush to add that extra layer of variation on top of them without losing the general basic shape while also creating some ledges where I saw fit. Here I used a big rotated rectangle to connect the ugly hills at the back with the rest of the build. I created some ledges around and an arch below, all using well, smooth and melt. And finally, I used roughen, distort and smooth to add some noise to these perfect slopes and flat areas without changing the shapes too much. So now it was time to fix the ugly hills at the back. For that, I chose to use the rock tool and different bicon brushes to create three sets of stuck rocks in a state of very doubtful equilibrium. I then used melt again, but this time in a more controlled manner to signify the division between some of the rocks. I didn't forget about the terrain at the front, for which I used a big slope to lower the entire thing down, followed by some more distortion, smooth and a few cylindrical rocks around it and in a few other areas where I felt it was missing something. I topped the thing off with another rotating rectangle that I then tweaked around to make it look like yet another doubtful rock in a video. And with that, and maybe a few more tweaks here and there, I ended up with a shape for the terrain that I'm absolutely happy with. So now, it's time to paint. We covered the painting tools in details in the previous episode of this tutorial series, but here on top of that we will mention a few things that we didn't get to cover in that video that are very useful to paint the terrain, and those are the tool masks. From up here, we can open and edit the mask menu. Let me make it larger so you can see better. To the right, we can see a few options, but before getting to see what they do, let me show you how this works. To activate the mask, you just need to drag one of the options into the other side where you see a yellow line appearing. We can then minimize this menu and as long as it's opened, the mask will work. Here we have created a simple mask of light gray wool, which means our tool will only work over that specific block and none other. We have other type of masks, for instance a white level mask, by default it's equal to 62, which would only paint blocks at that height, but something we can do is change the equal by clicking on it to for example greater. And let's put zero here, which will now paint, as you can see, any blocks that are higher than that. If we want to save a mask for later, we can just drag it down, it will stay there but not be active. We have a bunch of other mask types, but what I want you to see now are these three on the top, which are logical conditions. We have any, all and not. Let's check them out. You can see that any has like this little slot on it. We can then drag as many of the masks we've seen into that slot. We can see that we have all the masks separated by this slash, which indicates a logic or. That means that whenever any of the mask conditions are met, the tool will work. For instance, let's keep it simple and just use 3 as an example. We minimize this and now the tool will paint any light grey wool block, any block that is at white level 20, and any block that is near grass. The old condition works in a similar way, the difference is that now all the conditions that we drag into the slots have to be met simultaneously for the tool to work. So if we put block equal light grey wool and Y level 62, it will only paint the light grey wool at that specific height. And at last we have not, which will apply the mask to all the blocks except the ones that fulfill the mask condition. So in this case, it will not paint grey wool, but yes, light grey and grass. You can then combine all the different masks and the logical conditions together to create different effects and achieve the goals you have for your build or maybe just try and play around to see what you can get. That's up to you. But now let's see the angle masks, which are specifically useful for painting terrains. In this mask, we can put an angle in degrees, let's say minus 45. The orientation of this angle is as shown in this picture. Setting an angle mask greater or equal to minus 45 will only paint blocks that form a greater slope than that, leaving the flat areas untouched. This is useful to paint the cliffside of our terrain, where in most cases nature won't grow, meaning we will have a rocky material there. 
Inverting the sense of the tool to a less equal now will allow us to paint the flat areas where vegetation can grow, so we will symbolize that with green. Playing around with angle masks, different values of the angle, and perhaps combining it with the other ones, we can very quickly give the terrain a realistic look. Of course, later on you can tweak details around and add variation, because if we were to paint all the terrain with a single technique, it would look too repetitive. So what's important is to learn the techniques, but also to know when and where to apply them. For instance, here we could also use an old condition, combined with different Y levels to paint layers of terrain on the top part, to simulate, for example, a layer stratification like the ones we can see on the Mesa biomes. So now, I will spend some time using the mask and the painting techniques we've covered in the other video to finally bring this terrain to life and see the final results. Let's go. When I started with this terrain, I didn't have a clear idea of what I wanted, so I decided to have fun with it. I had just seen someone do a build with psychedelic colors and that inspired me to try it out. For that, I first painted the bigger cliffs with a purple noise pattern, masking only the grey wool so that I can later replace it. Then, I used one of my safety gradient presets that I created right before recording and painted the entire top part with these very vibrant colors. Of course, I had to iterate a few times until I got the gradient direction that I liked the most. I then used a different gradient to replace the purple noise we added before with some yellow colors that look like some splashes of paint. Using the same angle mask we've seen before, I painted the side of the cliffs with red as a placeholder, then I inverted the mask to paint the flat areas with lime wool, and spent some time spinning around the build so I didn't forget any hidden corners. While doing that, I found some awkward spots that I didn't completely terraform before, so I took some time to fix those, with melting, welding, smoothing and adding some rocks here and there, which of course then I had to paint. Once I had that, I repeated the same process that I did at the beginning to paint the pillars at the back, which ended in some more colorful pieces of terrain. Then I used a simpler and more desaturated gradient to replace all the red wool around the build, this way, the focus of the terrain remains on the main and more colorful structures. I decided that on top of the light grey structures where it's flat, I didn't want a grass material but some sand combination instead, and that was symbolized with the yellow wool. Then I made a third vibrant gradient, this time using green, blue and white, which I used to paint the arch at the back. Again, I iterated a few times until I got this sort of blue diagonal stripe on it that I really like. I used it also on the arch at the front. The rest of the light grey wool was painted with a simpler gradient again, also more desaturated than the rest, but this time of a lighter set of colors which I think are going to work better with the sand at the top. Now, it was finally time to replace the lime wool with a color combination that resembled grass. For that, I used the noise painter with grass, moss, green concrete powder and green terracotta. Something very similar I did for the yellow wool, but this time we used a combo of sand, suspicious sand, sandstone and bamboo. This is the moment where I realized that this wasn't just a random psychedelic build, but instead it reminded me of some coral reefs. So with that in mind, I went ahead and painted the final piece of the build. I first repeated the same thing for the cliff base, nothing new there, and before painting the rocks I used the infinite reach function of action and some black wool to try and mark the division of some of them. It won't stay black so don't worry about that. Here, I tried a few gradients until I arrived at one that I liked for the rocks, and then I patiently tried my best to paint all of them individually and in a way that sort of makes sense. At least for me. I reutilized some of the already used gradients and techniques to paint the base cliff and finally replace the black wool with some softer colors, but still darker than the ones used for each rock. At this point I was very happy with the terrain, but I couldn't stop seeing the coral reef now, so I had to commit to it. Just in case, I first made a copy of the build and moved it far apart. Right below it I created a sloped plane which then I randomized quite a bit, making use of the distortion tool. After smoothing it out, I decided I needed some more rocks, which meant, yes, you guessed it right, I had to paint them again with the angled masks. Luckily the gradients that I used were already saved for me, and once I finished with that I added a layer of blue wool on top of the white, which then I replaced with blue stained glass. And finally I added some light blue and cyan glass on top of it, using a noise pattern to try and simulate some waves. I then moved the entire build down until it fit into this sort of shore that I had just created, and with that the build was almost finished. The only thing missing was to add some decorations and vegetations, which I did in a very lazy manner with the Clentaminator tool 
and a few noise patterns to quickly create some custom kelp or seagrass. So here it is, it took way longer than expected, but I'm very happy with the terrain we created for this tutorial, and it's probably the one you saw in the thumbnail. I very much hope you found all this information useful, and if you enjoyed the video, remember to like it, leave a comment or subscribe, that really helps me out. And if you want to support me or my content further, you can do that on my Ko-fi link or Patreon, where you can download this build as well. Thank you so much for watching, this has been Calvin, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.